Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. And good to see you tonight. So yeah, we're going to, I'll share a bit of my story and now Julie's going to share hers and we'll share a bit about how God brought us together and the ministry of Street Connect was launched. It'll be 10 years ago in May since the ministry started. And there's a verse of scripture over the past few years that it's kind of, God continues just to blow my mind with the things he's done and the things he's doing and what he's going to do. And it's Ephesians 3 verse 20 where it says, Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or think, according to his great power at work within us. An emphasis on his great power at work within us. So give, just to give an example of, I believe was a kind of defining moment um, in my life. So I, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Um, my dad was a Catholic, my mum was a Protestant. So around religion, I thought it was as much to do with that. If someone wants to know are you a Catholic or a Protestant, it was to know do you support Rangers or Celtic. So I kind of tried to answer that one carefully. But, uh, <laughs> so I, I remember one, it was one it was one evening and it was it was a cold it was a cold uh, sorry one morning a very cold winter's morning and it was that cold in my flat that you could see my breath it was storage heating and i didn't have the heating on i remember drinking a cup of coffee after swallowing loads of medication prescribed and illicit drugs as well as about to take some heroin and there's a big ban on my door and i ignored it and then there's another bar on the door, and then someone shouts the name through the letterbox, it's Jimmy! And I ignored it again because, and he says, I'm looking to buy some, he was wherever he was looking to buy some drugs, and I'd got so full of depression, anxiety, panic attacks through um, drug-induced panic attacks, and it was in a, it was in a morning like that, I remember, just feeling so broken and lost, that although I didn't directly call out to God, I do think in a moment such as that God saw the cry of my heart and he brought someone into my life, someone who had done a programme called Team Challenge. And ironically, this person came to the flat to buy some drugs because he'd relapsed, and, but there was something different about him. And he, he would invite, he invited me up to his house and I went in and he had this music on in the background. I was like, what in earth is this you're listening to? And it was Matt Redman. He says, oh, it's Christian music. And I thought, I don't even know if you get Christian music like this. <laughs> and then he said, do you want a Bible? And I says, no thanks. And he said, you sure? And the other few I says, no, because I, I won't read it. I don't, I don't want a Bible. And, but there was something in this man that was different than most other people I knew. I grew, I grew up in a housing estate. Um, my mum and dad split when I was a baby. And by the age of 13, I was becoming insecure of who I was. Found um, solace in alcohol. And started drinking that on the weekend. And by the age of 18, I progressed through every drink and drug you could think of. And, but I, had, I wanted to do something better with my life. So, I uh, went and I'd done a college course. My dad lived in Dubai, so I went out there to work for a while. Came back, moved to Edinburgh, was doing a college course, but I was drinking every day and I was prescribed Valium and I was taking other kinds of drugs. But then I moved in with my cousin who was selling heroin at the time, although I didn't know it. I moved in with him, very quickly got caught up in all um, the madness that that came around with um, heroin and him selling the drugs and then ended up in prison, came out and as I said that's when I got <coughs> things just spiralled out of control, it seemed to get worse and worse and worse until likes of a moment like I said where I would be full of depression and anxiety and just in a complete mess of substance abuse and chaos and um, once I met this guy, he, as I said, he told me about, he went on and told me about Teen Challenge. And I thought, I, I don't want to go to rehab. I don't need rehab. My life's fine. But as you can hear, it wasn't fine. And I eventually got to a point where I thought, right, I'll go. I'll 
even give that Christian. One ago, and I went down to Wales, and I arrived in South Wales, and then the guy picked me up at the train station to me to the rehab. And I remember waking up in the morning, we're getting woke up in the morning, and he says, we do a service downstairs, do you want to come down? So I thought, okay, I'll go down. I I'd never been in a church service before, so I sat at the back, and anyone that knows Team Challenge, it's quite a Pentecostal kind of approach to faith. So I was sat at the back, and it was probably not much smaller than this, it's probably the same amount of people, and had drums, guitars, keyboard, and they all started singing, and everybody stood, had their hands in the air, were singing it, and I remember looking up, they had their hands up, and I'm looking up, thinking, what are they doing? <laughs> and I sat down in the back, and I remember putting my head in my hand, and I thought, what have I got myself into? And, but very quickly I saw that a lot of the people in there had something that I didn't have, and I very quickly found that that was Jesus. So I asked Jesus into my life, and in April 2007 and I wish I could say it was all got easier from there but um, I started to realise that without any substances in my body I didn't know. I remember looking in the mirror I was 28 years old and thinking I don't even know I don't even know myself without taking something and I was drawn to the, the men that were carrying on and doing things they shouldn't have been doing because the other ones kind of scared me a bit because they were so different from me and the way they went on and how they conducted themselves. So I was drew to the ones that would be carrying on and have the kind of street mentality. So eventually I kept getting held back. They transferred me down to London and I thought, I'm going to, like, right, I'm going to screw them up now and I'm going to just, I'm going to do this. And I started reading the Bible a lot. Started feeling really getting a good connection with God, but I re looking back, I recognised I had a lot of baggage and a lot of things from my past that were preventing me from really moving forward and I went back, I was down in East London at the time and I was, I, I was looking at doing a course, so I wanted to do a university course and I remember praying and I remember God speaking me through Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things shall be given to you. Because before that, I wanted, I wanted a wife, I wanted a car, I wanted a good job, I wanted um, a nice house. And all things I don't think God didn't want me to have, but I was looking for these things before God. And I kind of felt like at that point, I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I wanted God to come and bless what I wanted to do and take him where I always wanted to go. But I found faith doesn't quite work like that. And... Came out of there, um, had a big relapse, ended up in homeless accommodation in East End of London, and I had this big overdose in this homeless hostel where I literally died. And the guy was begging it on his phone, brought me back to life, and showed me it on my phone. I was lying grey and blue lips, and felt like God had given me another chance, but I'd ended up in quite a mess down there for a while but there was a church that I kept going back and forward to because I knew that if I'm going to get out of this it's going to be through God. I kind of knew that he's, this is my way out and I need God in my life but I had all this stuff that I was kind of trying to work through at the same time and again I'd lean on what was my coping mechanism was alcohol Valium and then before long ended in heroin, methadone, crack cocaine and it was just a bit of a, um, a kind of difficult period as you could imagine. I got home flat and I was still, I was engaging with the church and I started finding that I was making some good connections in the church, made some real friends because when I look back most of the people I knew were acquaintances that I used drugs with or wanted me for money or would want to be around me for something so I was always guarded to kind of let people in to my life and it was one night I'd, I took these drugs and I ended up in a bit of a mess and I just I had my own flat at this point and I remember falling to my knees and just bursting out crying and saying God I can't do this anymore and I kept bumping into Teen Challenge outreach workers in London 
saying, you should go back to Team Chad. I said, there's no way I am going back there. And uh, I had a drugs worker who was try I was, like, trying to get in these detox centers, non-Christian ones. And the doors just were closed all the time. And this thought just came to me. There's one door open and one only. And I thought, there's no way I am going back to Team Challenge. And then eventually, in that night, I fell to my knees and said, God, even if it means going back to Team Challenge, I'll do it. And a few months later, I went back to Team Challenge, the beginning of 2010. And I remember looking in that same mirror where I'd been three years previously. And I remember it was the first time I could look at myself as an adult and accept myself for who God had made me to be without substances in my system. And it was a defining moment for me. I went to, I'd done a ministry training program, uh, went and worked at the centre a bit. And then there was a church in, in South Wales, a town called Merefley. <coughs> And I got paired up with this woman through an outreach, um, and she sat beside me here. So I'll pause there for a moment, and I'll hand over to Julie. Yeah, so similarly to Ricky, I've done a Team Challenge programme. I got brought up by my mum and dad, and I lived with my two sisters and my brother. And my mum and dad did try um, their best, they worked hard, and when I look back now, they were good parents, but when I was growing up, I had like a chip on my shoulder. My family, I just wanted to get away from my family. I was in rebellion. I wanted to drink and um, just do whatever I wanted to do, really. And so it was about 12, 13 that things really started to escalate. In high school, I ended up getting expelled. I was drinking all the time. I felt like there was something missing inside me, and I didn't know what that was. And um, I remember, yeah, just getting into trouble all the time, and then eventually, at 15, got expelled, then found out I was pregnant. And so when I found out I was pregnant, I stopped drinking, stopped smoking, thought I'm going to be a good mum. Um, that did not go to plan at all. My daughter was born and it wasn't very long until all I wanted to do was drink. I was, I was addicted to alcohol and so I started making up for lost time. Any time that I got out to have a drink, I would get absolutely blurred basically. And so my life just quickly started spiraling again. I ended up in a homeless unit with my daughter. I ended up getting into another bad relationship and at 17 found out I was pregnant again, had my son. So at 17 years old I had two little children and I was really, really just lost and broken and I didn't know who I was and I was looking for acceptance and all the wrong things. I went to college at 18 thinking I'm really going to just try and be a good mum try and get a life and provide for them and do well. And I remember one night I had a party, I invited everybody back to my house and that was the night that I ended up trying heroin. And so everything that had been bad in my life before, all the minor things that I had done, stealing, getting into trouble, all of a sudden this different, um, this, just this different world of darkness opened up all of a sudden. My children ended up in care. People were at the door looking for money. And it was just this whole lot of darkness that came very quickly into my life. I tried to get off of drugs and I did get off of drugs for a short period of time and I got my children back because they were going to get adopted. And this time, when I relapsed, it was far worse than any of the times before. Probably because people had higher expectations this time that I was going to get my children back, that everything was going to be fine, and it wasn't. And there's always this... People can think that when people are in drug addiction, they don't love their kids. But I used to cry like every night. We, me and my two children had a really strong bond, but my addiction always pulled me away from them. Now we have a really good relationship 
and then we'll get to that part once we get to the next part of the story. <coughs> so I just remember it was one morning and the birds were twerping, tweeting, tweeting, twerping. And I used to hate that sound because it was another day. I was so depressed, I had nobody in my life, nobody wanted to talk to me at all. And I remember really crying out to God. I knew there was a God We'd, in school. We had services when I was younger and I'd heard about Jesus and everything like that, but I had never decided to follow him or give my life up. There was a real cry in my heart that night and before I had prayed, God, if you get me out of trouble, I promise I'll be good. And there was no depth to it, I'd get out of trouble and I certainly wouldn't be good after that. But there was something real about it. It was a real heart's prayer that I was going to follow Jesus for the rest of my life once if he helped me and he did and I remember the thing that came into my mind was this woman who I'd met two years previously in McDonald's she had told me about a teen challenge program and she told me no drugs no smoking no this no that and I was like no way no way am I going there because I had when you're on drugs your mind's quite warped and also you look at superstars and you hear oh they're going to these amazing rehabs with a detox that they choose a swimming pool all these things so that was in my mind what I wanted from a rehab that was not what God had for me that's not what I needed and so I worked with this woman and ended up going down a teen challenge in 2009. And that was really where I gave my heart to Jesus. I had women, similarly, the first time I went in, I was like, what on earth is, is this all about? But I had that, I stayed down there for two and a half years and I had women around there who really poured their hearts into me. They've gave their life up. They spend all their time working down there um, day and night. And I recently went down to visit and they said I always had, I was always challenging something. Um, so I have, because I have my son who now likes to challenge everything <laughs> with us. So um, they were just reminding me that I was like that when I first went in. So it, it's good to be reminded of those things. So yeah, two and a half years spent down in Wales. We went to the church and yeah, Frankie, I'll pass it back over to you. Yeah, I think when I shared of that that moment when I fell to my knees and I was crying, the tears were running down my face and I couldn't do it anymore. I remember the first um, when I was doing the school of Men the team challenge, what they call the school of ministry training, the first time I had to preach was on they gave you a verse, and it was John 12, 24. Because unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it will remain a single grain. But if it falls to the ground and dies, it will produce much grain. And when I was preaching, it just it just made me think of that first kind of three years of my Christian journey, was that I was like that seed that hadn't died effectively. So I wanted to do it my way, on my terms and in my timing and I've realised it's actually his way, his time and his will so I had to come to a place where I would surrender my will over to him and it was through that surrender then over a period of time I started to see some fruit bearing because there was no real fruit although inwardly God was doing a lot of stuff in me but outwardly there was like zero fruit um, but God done started doing a real transformation Work, as I mentioned, we we were doing an outreach. I had a meeting on Monday, actually, with a, one of our part, our partnership coordinator and two pastors in South Wales. One of the um, pastors is um, was the was the leader of the outreach that we where we met, and the other one was uh, someone I did ministry training with a few years down the line, and we were just chatting and. I was joking about the outreach. She says, oh yeah, that's where, that's where me, me and Julie met in Steve's outreach, where Julie came came on to me on the streets <laughs> of the <there. laughs> And then stopped. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's ironic the way it turned around in that we're now in discussion with this church about running a Street Connect partnership project in the town of the Methley. So as we did outreach together, Julie, went back up to Scotland, to Glasgow, I went back down to London where I'd been before. 
And I just really felt God prompting about doing an outreach with the church I'd been in before when I was in a mess, because they really helped me. And I didn't share, but one point, I was getting, I'd got kicked out of my flat that I was in, and um, the, one of the elders of the church took me in. So he knew I was on methadone, he knew I was taking these other drugs, and he had like three, we had two teenage kids, one had just left home, and I stayed with them for a few months. I just thought he really showed me the love of Christ. And anyway, I went back down there and helped him start an outreach into um, this area in the east end of London. There was a lot of homelessness and a lot of um, kind of deprivation. And started seeing some really fruitful ministry. But I'd met Julie, and it was, um, we both kind of felt there was something more in it. So Julie came down to London on her birthday um, 10 years ago, just over 10 years ago, August the 17th, and we went out for a meal in the, in, uh, the centre of London, went to the West End Theatre, and I had I bought a ring because I thought I'm going to do it, and I'm <laughs> going to make a big deal about it, so I thought I'll take for a meal, we'll go to the theatre, and we got in one of those things, you know, where the cycle and you go in the back, so it was going along the Thames, and we got off and we were walking along the Thames, and right outside St Paul's Cathedral there's a bridge to go over the south um, side of the city, we were walking over the bridge, and I thought, right, I'm going to propose that over with the cathedral in the background, and if I'm going to wait for a quiet minute, it was round, anyone has been in central London, there is no such thing, and it was just a I'm just going to have to do it. So I got down on my knee and everyone stopped. I was watching and I better not say no. Finally, <laughs> she said yes. But I say that story because Julie often jokes and I say that um, she thought I was a real romantic because ever since that moment you've just went <laughs> So I'm believing that one day I might get that up and crowd again, but I'm not quite, I'm not quite there. And, Anyways, I moved up to Glasgow. Julie, do you want to share when you came back up to Glasgow? Yeah, so happened? for me, moving back up to Glasgow was really good building a relationship back up with my children. So that's what I did. And then, Ricky, me and you got married. And we got Zoe and Mark back aged 11, 13. They came to live with us. So that was, um, yeah, our start of the marriage and that had its ups and downs but both of them are really like solid kids aren't they they're like really you wouldn't think the things that they've been through had happened my daughter just graduated from university she's um, doing social work she's just got a job she wants to work with children who have been through a similar um things and my son Mark, they said he had ADHD, his behaviour was linked to my behaviour mostly and he's like you couldn't meet anybody more laid back really than him so that's a testimony to God I would say because he didn't just heal me, he healed them as well in an amazing way and not long after we got Zoe and Mark back we started Street Connect and so uh, somebody says, what did I say recently? I says, since we got married, it's been brutal. <laughs> he was like, oh, that's... <laughs> but it has just felt like it's been non-stop. I mean, we did not expect Street Connect. We thought we wanted to reach out, tell people about what had happened up to us, tell them about Jesus, reach out. That was really it, simply on a Saturday night in a cafe in Glasgow. And so then, and it's grew and grew and blossomed. And so, yeah, we're really grateful for that. And maybe you can tell you some. Yeah. So, I said to Ian, oh, we won't speak for half an hour. We're not having to tell us what we need to speak. But yeah, when, we could, when there was a pastor in City City in Glasgow <coughs> that had a cafe space and wanted to do something about homelessness and addiction, it was kind of right out the front doorstep. Julie had been volunteering in the cafe and we went along. She was looking at doing something with women and the girl pulled out who was looking to do it. I went along to a meeting with the pastor and he asked us to help him do an outreach. And that was on the 4th, 4th of May, 2013. We had the first night. So we knew a few people in other churches. So we said, right, we're going to do an outreach. And I think, 
I think people thought they were coming to something like this. So there would be yeah, some, there'd be some worship songs on, there would be testimony. And we had about 40 people came. And it was like, right, nobody knows we're here. The need is out there. Here's some flyers. Let's pray and let's get out onto the streets. And then the following Saturday, we came and there was about eight of us. So I think people realised we're not just coming to be blessed, but we're coming to actually get out onto, onto the streets. So it kind of started gaining momentum. And we moved to Govan, and that's where we felt God wanted us to be. And so we wanted to be a church in the community. But that's where um, we got a phone call from the pastor the first Saturday night after the cafe. And he says, two of the men that came to the cafe last night, he's brought in, came to church today. And it was like, ah, great, praise God. He says, yeah, one of them tried to walk out the door with a handbag down his <laughs> And I was like, ah, right. Uh, so the congregation were used to just leaving handbags and phones and things lying in the cafe. Not used to homeless people and people in addiction coming in. So we said, right, let's go for a let's go for a few months. Just help them get used to people because we ended up being there for eight years, ended up on the leadership team, ended up uh, doing ministry training. We both did the ministry training ordained into um, pastorship and things kind of grew but our core ministry was was Street Connect so by the following year as it started as a church outreach the pastor said we should set this up as its own charity but I didn't know this now but he was also a pastor in Bradford and our wish church there grew a charity we have heard that transforming lives were good TLG that does stuff for kids so he was pastor when the guy was coming up through through this, so he said, I've been and done this before, so we set it up on, and it became a registered charity on the 23rd of May 2014. And it's grew quite a bit over the years. Um, so it's, we developed a model of service that eventually we thought could be replicated. And we always thought the church was at the heart of what Street Connect does and Jesus being at the centre. Our model, really, it wasn't anything clever. It was just reading the Bible, Jesus was out on the streets with the people, let's do it. And then seeing other people doing drop-ins, we started running a community recovery program um, in partnership with Bethany Christian Trust. So we started running recovery groups, doing one-to-one support, preparing people for Christian rehab. And eventually we got some flats where um, we could put people in an aftercare and support them as they re-enter the community after rehab. So today we've got three flats, um, we're hoping to have a fourth one at some point this year. We've got a staff team of about 20 and there were 80 volunteers in working out of seven different churches at the minute. We've partnered with 11 churches today, but we um, feel God's given us a vision to replicate around the UK. So for the past two and a half years, we've been working with a charity called Cinnamon Network, who are experts in replicating um, Christian social action projects um, within churches. And I spoke at a conference about, you know, what good news to the poor, what is good news to the poor? And I, I shared on it, um, like evangelism and social action, it's not a case of either or, it's a case of both and. Good news to them, when we first see them, how can you help me? Can you give me some money? Can you give me some clothes? Can you give me some money? No, we can't give you some money. We've got a policy, we don't give you some money, but we can give you this support. And um, as it's kind of grown, um, we've just been able to reach into some communities. We partnered in Govan with Govan Free Church, Norman Mackay, for, for a, a number of years. And within the past couple of years, we had a lot on street and it was really growing. And it was just, I felt it was time to step back from our role in the local church to fully focus on the ministry of Street Connect and we wanted to be a church in government like I said before so when we were praying we, we both felt in um, government free church so we've been going there for about 18 months we also partnered with the free church in Blackwood and Kirkmuir Hill and we work with churches of um, we're in it with denominational charities so we work with churches across the board and we're just, uh, we feel we're now in a position to move from regional. Most of our, all of our partnerships in the Greater Glasgow region. We did a pilot project in Kent for two years with a church. 
it went well, but it, it really realised we had a lot of stuff to sort out before we were ready to go further afield. All that's in place. And we're hoping to bring on five new church partnerships this year. As I mentioned we're chatting with one in Glenelfly, one in Aberdeen, a few in the Greater Glasgow region. And we just want to see people come to experience that life changing hope of the gospel. So we know that's what's changed our lives and continues to change our lives. And I shared that verse at the beginning of Ephesians 3.20. And no one time is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or think according to his great power at work within us. And when I think, when I was in that flat and I had no heating and my, I was in a complete mess, I had no hope. I didn't see any way forward. I didn't think I would be able to do anything with my life. But God saw the brokenness and how he could change that mess and use it for his glory. And even if it stopped now, I would be amazed at what God's done. But the beautiful thing is he's not finished. And there's still so much more he wants to do. And when I think of when I wanted all these good things, you know, the car, I have them now. I've got a beautiful wife. I've got four kids. My two stepkids are too old. And they're seven and six. I'm glad they're all on the road because it could be a bit wild <laughs> at times. And then... You know, I've got a car, I've got, got right I've got my dog, and I've got, we've got a house in Durham. We like to put our roots in the community. We've lived there for 10 years, but we wanted to buy and put our roots in the community um, and be a light in the darkness. And we've just, every, and a job. I thought I was, I wanted to go in IT. I had IT qualifications. I'm so glad I'm not in that, because it probably wouldn't suit who I am, and I, I love what I do, and I just love seeing people's lives being transformed and just helping helping people move from where they are to where they want to get to and introducing them to Jesus along the way. Yeah. Julie, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I just I think that that's something that God's called us to do is just to be that example that people from addiction can change, can live a good life and keep walking right and that's how we say thanks to all the people that have helped us as well and so that we've got the blessing of being able to help others and see them doing well and there's nothing that's better than that. It's not always all rosy. I mean I say we've been to as many weddings of people we've helped as funerals so it's a tough work at times but God encourages us as we go along and yeah, yeah. So thanks for listening. <laughs> to challenge 
so many people. We just thank you, Lord, that each and every one of us here this evening have been really challenged in our ministry. Are we doing everything that God has asked us to do? So I just pray, Lord, a special, a special blessing upon them, a special blessing upon their work. And we just thank you, Lord, that you have brought them into our past, that we can look to them, that they can inspire us to move on deeper and upwards into your call on our lives, so that your name will be glorified. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 <coughs> Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you with all our hearts for what we've heard this evening from Ricky and Julia. The wonderful work that you have called them to do. We know from our own hearts, we know from your own word, that you absolutely love lost sinners. And we were all lost sinners toward you. You had mercy upon us. You brought us to yourself. Father in heaven, would you tonight afresh give us that love and desire to reach those from whatever area they're from in our cities, our town communities. We pray, Lord, that you would help us as your church here on earth to share the wonderful good news that Jesus loved us and loves us and died for ordinary folk like ourselves. Thank you for the work that that Derek and Julia are doing, Lord, and the wonderful change that you brought into their lives. Lord, with you nothing is impossible. As say as say Ricky mentioned from that magnificent verse, Lord in Ephesians, Lord we nothing, absolutely nothing is impossible for you. And we pray this evening that you would help us as we leave the place later on to be challenged afresh. We now live, Lord, in a Scotland that is quite multi-international. You have brought them over to us. You've given us the word in our hearts. Lord, help us, please help us not to be silent at all, but to share the good news of Jesus with them. Continue with us, Lord. Be with Ricky and Julia say, who are all, all over the country. Bless their families. Use them mightily to your glory. And thank you for the costume center here, Lord. We pray that so many more would come out to hear the gospel on Sunday. And in um, special evenings like we have tonight. Continue with us then. For Jesus' sake, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Any, any questions for for Ricky and Julie? <coughs> or observations? I don't see any hands, I'll just pounce. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question. I was just thinking about um, the, the young kids that you've got, the six and seven year old. Um, how do you manage to kind of balance working with the folks who are in addiction with having two young kids? You know, with, are they, you know, do you, do you find that you want to shelter them or do you try and encourage them to see what's around? I would say, in part, neither. It's just part of our life. And so the have a certain amount of understanding. I've put things in place probably through the way you can work and work and go looking after everybody else and forget about your family. So over the past few years, just putting certain disciplines in place, making sure, you know, I work at the school gate to be collecting them and different things and put more boundaries, I would say, over the last maybe two or three years. Otherwise, we would be, um, 
completely burnt out and the kids have been neglected in a sense. So, but they, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering this very well. I guess we don't know loads of details about everything, but they, it's part of it. I mean, we live in Govan as well, so in our church there's people who are like <coughs> on drugs and drink and everything, so we want them just to be normal. Um, and that. And they don't see a lot of the work we do. We've got a big, we've got a good sized team now as well, so it's not just so reliant on me and Julie. You know, we've got Julie manages the operations team, that's all the frontline staff team and partnership and our support workers and our senior support workers. So we've got a full team and so the kids, you know, sometimes if there's a drop there's an event, sometimes they'll come along. So I guess to them they just see them see it as kind of normal stuff. They're not seeing it anything that I would be odd, ordinary to them, of course, but I'm sure to others. It is, but yeah, as Julie says, we did we we put in some good boundaries around them to ensure that kids don't get neglected at all. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, Julie. Um, I was just thinking about your parents and your sisters and how hard it must have been for them when you rebelled and chose the path that you did. Um, have you been reconciled with them or what happened um, along the way with your own family? So it's our, particularly my mum, she was really strained. Thing that when she took, my mum took me to that meeting with uh, the women from Teen Challenge the first time around, the women observed, all we did was argue. That was all we did uh, for many, many years. But since even when I came home, my family weren't quite sure what was going on. So I had went from being a drug addict to now I was a Christian sitting there and as far as they could see, wasn't doing this, wasn't doing that. And so there was all of that to work through and it was almost like in a sense they were kind of pushing to see if it was real or it wasn't real and just working it all out. But God has really restored my mom's relationship my sisters um, and my, my brother as well. So yeah, we get on good now. We don't argue <laughs> constantly. <laughs> so yeah, but they're okay. Yeah. Good. Excellent. So I'm just going to read some words and then um, maybe you can do the, the spiel about the stuff on the table. I'll be on it. So we read in God's word. Um, now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to, to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany reclining the table in the home of a man known as Simon Leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can have them any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, whatever the gospel is preached through the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the life changing that you bring into our lives. And we pray, Lord, from what we hear tonight, that we would be said of us, he or she did what she could, what he could. We thank you, Lord, that um, as the gospel is preached throughout the world, that account, that story, that event is remembered. And we believe, Lord, that we will remember this night because we have all been challenged, Lord. Uh, yes, to help the poor, but also 
to proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ saves sinners like us. So bless uh, our evening together as we enjoy fellowship together, food together next door in the cafe. And Lord, we thank you for the list of things that we will hear about from Steve Connect. We thank you that we can support them. And we pray, Lord, that even here in, in the building here with the flats at the back, Lord, maybe this could be a partner church, Ross Keating Free Church, with the facilities uh, that we have here. So we pray this in Jesus.